Hello from Fox News in Washington. We are still about a year out from seeing voters head to the polls in 2024 primaries, but the Republican field is taking shape with several candidates already declared. And there is a lengthy roster of potential candidates promising decisions in the coming months. Many of those high profile names are making high profile trips to those early primary and caucus states. In a moment, we will speak live with Republican Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, who is the subject of some recent speculation fresh out of Iowa. But first, a look at his recent travels to that all-important state. As I hear more from the constituents here in Iowa and around the country, it will give me more information on what to do next. Tim Scott's travels in Iowa have the feel of a campaign, minus the official announcement. For America to be at our best, we have to work together. His Faith in America tour is the latest moment in a fast rise from a single parent home to congressman to senator. I would like to introduce to you our Senate elect Tim Scott. Thank you. As the Senate's only black Republican, Scott has worked for bipartisan consensus on tough issues. I take the issue of policing in America seriously. I want our body to see it not as an issue of Republicans versus Democrats, but as good people standing in the gap, elected to do a job that we all ran to do. Today, Scott is sharing his story of growing up poor, inspired by his mother. My mom said we could be victims or victors. She chose victorious. He's focused on the positive, but he's taking shots at President Biden. I understand that President Biden lives in the past because he's been in Washington for 50 years. He's drawn serious 2024 speculation, but is now on the spot to make the case for himself. What are the differences in terms of policy positions that, for example, you may have with President Trump? Probably not very many at all. So joining us now to discuss his potential White House run, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. Senator, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Good morning, Shannon. I hope you're doing well. I am. Hope you are as well. I'm sure you uh, are a Thank little God. bit jet lagged maybe because you've spent a lot of time in <laughs> Iowa and that's gotten a lot, of, a lot of notice. You've been testing a message there. Do you now see a lane for you in the 2024 GOP primary? You know, Shannon, more important than a lane for me is, do we have a lane for young kids growing up in single parent households like I did? Looking at moms, single mothers who are working 16 hours a day like my mom did, can we make sure that the lane to the American dream is wide open for them? I spent the day with Governor Reynolds who just passed monumental school choice reform, a powerful tool to make sure that parents have a choice and kids have a chance. So. My focus is still on the mission of making sure that every single American believes that the American dream is achievable for them. So you talk with an optimistic message. Um, we talked about how you are highlighting faith, not only in the religious sense, but that you want Americans to have faith in each other. I want to put up a recent Fox News yes. poll about how Americans feel uh, about things today. They say we are dysfunctional f uh, family, 81 percent of them. Is it realistic to believe that you or any other politician can get us out of our corners and get people back to a place where there isn't so much division? There's no doubt, Shannon, that when you look at that poll, that's one of the reasons why I think it's really important for us to come forward and have an authentic, sincere conversation about the goodness of America. In today's society, the progressive left is trying to make America into a grievance culture, when in fact we've always stood on the foundation of greatness. Our original sin should never define us because the story of redemption is what we've been living for more than 50 plus years. The greatest story of progress in the world is American progress in the last 50 years. I wish we'd spend more time talking about the goodness of this nation and stop the cancel culture. Okay, let's talk about this positive message and, and talking about things like cancel culture. Will it work? The New York Times says this uh, about your assets of being optimistic and possibly history making as the nominee. Both those assets could prove to be a liability in today's Republican primary environment where voters rail against what they see as unfair favoritism toward people of color and where activists may be more interested in anger than optimism. Everybody says they hate negative ads. They don't like the political sniping, but the numbers show us they actually work. So will this optimistic message work? 
Well, certainly, I think it's always worked. I mean, America is, is a country founded on the concept of hope. Think about it this way. A world without America is a very dark place. America without faith is a, is a nation without hope. So we definitely have to continue to work on the foundation that we have stood upon for the last 250 plus years. But in addition to that, we have to be able to contrast between why we are a great country and why the left wants us to talk about grievance. The fact is that the left is trying to sell a drug of victimhood and the narcotic of despair. The truth is that we have so much to celebrate, and yet today, in many parts of the country, you feel like you're in quicksand. We should not allow the zip code of a child to determine the quality of their life because education is the most powerful tool to equalize opportunity in this nation, but there are poor zip codes where that's not possible. We have to do something about that as one American family, and frankly, governors like Kim Reynolds and others are starting to take that responsibility and prove that we as the GOP, the Great Opportunity Party, we love America, we love our kids, and frankly, we are the best hope for a united future. Okay, I want to talk about school choice in a minute, but a couple of other things about your yes, um, trip through Iowa. So not everybody thought your message was uplifting, including this one reporter from the New York Magazine's Intelligence, or he says this, it's hard to recall a more stridently asserted expression of belief that the route to national peace and unity requires the subjugation of one party by the other. The Scott's speech was a relentlessly partisan screed accusing Joe Biden and the left of pursuing a blueprint for ruining America. So how does that square with the message of us having faith in, in each other as Americans? Well, Shannon, that's, that's a great question. Once again, it goes back to the contrast that is necessary. I'm a hopeful guy, not because I did, haven't overcome problems. I had a miserable beginning. Growing up in a single parent household, mired in poverty, the challenges that I faced from self-esteem to low grades were monumental. I overcame those challenges with grit, hard work, and inspiration. And so the truth is the left today, they have, seems to be working on a blueprint on how to ruin America. If you wanted to ruin America, you would print and spend trillions of dollars leading to the highest inflation we've seen in 40 years. Why is that negative to point out the fact that under Joe Biden's leadership, we've had the highest inflation in 40 years? Why is it negative to point out that we've had four and a half million people cross our southern border illegally? Why is it negative to point out the fact that we've had 100,000 deaths to overdoses linked to fentanyl, thousands upon thousands of those deaths. If we don't understand the state of America and the weakness in the, of the progressive movement, then it's impossible for us to offer positive, optimistic solutions to the challenges that we face because of the progressive wing of the Democrat Party. You touch there, and you do often, about your personal story. It's very inspiring and compelling to people, whether they support you or not. Um, but even your supporters say there has to be more. Uh, an opinion piece very favorable to you says this. You're a talented candidate finding your theme, but you have to be careful not to substitute first-person narrative for an argument about why he is the right person to lead the country. So if you get in, what is the argument for you, policy-wise, versus President Trump or anybody else who gets into this field? How are you different or better than the other options? Well, Shannon, one of the things that I love to take time to talk about, and I hope we have about 30 minutes left to have this conversation, <laughs> is, is less. the policy. <laughs> okay, sounds good. The policy positions that I've taken. One of the most important parts of being in the majority was the opportunity we have with the Tax and Cut and Jobs Act. I had the good fortune to be the lead sponsor of the TCJA on the personal side of the tax code. So I had the opportunity to help write that specific legislation, and we lowered the taxes for a single mom by 70%. We promised to put more than $4,000 back in the average family's pocket. We ended up around $4,400. We were able to lower unemployment for African Americans, Hispanics, and Asians to the lowest level in the history of the country and the lowest level since World War II for women. We actually saw more money come to the Treasury with lower taxes than anyone imagined. And at the exact same time, wages grew at the bottom faster than at the top. I created Opportunity Zones, my signature legislation, that has seen more than $50 billion attack poverty in the hardest hit areas of the country. 
At the same time, I focused on education. I started the School Choice Caucus. We led to the highest level of funding for HBCUs in the history of the country, and then we made it permanent. I led on the vast majority of those pieces of legislation. I've worked on police reform, where we want to make sure that the best wear the badge, that the officers have the best resources, the best training, and we never question their qualified immunity. We have to stand in the gap when it matters the most. That means leading from the front okay. and not from the back. I want to make sure quickly, if we can, because I want to get a couple of, to a couple of those yes, issues. School choice. Um, Lisa Leitner, a special education advocate, said what you do is end up hurting public schools when you let parents take the money elsewhere. She says the vision is that the same amount of money spread out over more schools, only the best would survive. If a public school has to compete with a charter or private school, it will find a way to become better. But she asks, how can they improve if you take even more money from them? It's just not possible. Your response. Certainly, let's look at Success Academy in New York City, where you see their population is about 87% minority, and yet their schools are, t are at the top in the state of New York. What we've seen very s consistently, charter schools get about half the money as public schools, yet they are public charter schools that provides choice for the parents and better quality education. Out of the top 25% you know, of high schools in the nation, more than about 12 or half of, the, half of those are charter schools. So what we're seeing around the country is the success of some form of school choice. And by the way, I don't care whether it's a public school, a private school, a charter school, a STEM school, a home school, a virtual school. I want every child in every zip code to have quality education. That should improve all aspects of education, not reduce funding. Okay, I asked Ambassador Haley about this last week, um, that this article that says the GOP, essentially that you and Ambassador Haley give the GOP cover on issues of race. It says Scott's message is that racism is not an institutional or systemic problem, but an individual failing. That's precisely what conservatives want to hear so they can say, well, I'm not a racist, which means we don't have to do much of anything about racism. The only word I can think of is hogwash. The fact of the matter was I was in Austin on Friday having a conversation with uh, several hundred GOPers, and we talked specifically about how the Jim Crow South impacted my family specifically. My grandfather made the choice to be stubborn in his faith, his faith in the future, faith in himself, and faith in this nation. But we had to overcome those challenges. What I don't like is when we hear President Biden talked about Jim Crow 2.0 when my family lived through Jim Crow, and that's when you had to figure out the number of jelly beans in a jar in order to cast a ballot to suggest that the current Georgia election laws are consistent with Jim Crow. It's just a lie. And so what we have to do is make sure that we arm our people today with the challenges of today and not pretend like we're living in 1923 as opposed to 2023. All right, we have to go, Senator, but do you have a timeline for making an announcement or decision? Well, I'm going, I made the decision to go to church at 1130 today. <laughs> I will be following you there after the show as well. When you decide about your political future, Amen. please let us know. Yes, ma'am. Have a great day. Senator, thank you. Subscribe to the Fox News YouTube channel to catch our nightly opens, stories that are changing the world and changing your life. I'm Tucker Carlson tonight.